Welcome to Central Georgia Focus. I'm your host this week, Caitlin Heck. Uh, the new year signals new law discussions for the state of Georgia. 2024 Georgia legislative session scheduled to convene in Atlanta January 8th and go until March 28th. So between now and March, Georgia state legislators expected to tackle some key issues, including new and returning topics, as well as issues important to Central Georgians. So today we are joined by Democratic State Representative James Beverly. He is the minority leader of the House of Representatives. Also joined by Republican Senator John Kennedy, who is the president pro tempore. So welcome to you both. Thank you for being here with us today. Indeed. Good right. morning. Glad to be here. Thank you, Caitlin. Good. I know you guys have a busy schedule ahead as we get into uh, January through March. So we just want to talk about some of your top priorities as we go into this legislative session. First, talking about the new redistricting maps, how we got here and what are your thoughts on what's come out of that order? Yeah, um, well, from my from our perspective, we we followed the judge's order. Uh, there are going to be two additional seats in the Senate where black people have an opportunity to choose the candidate of their choice one Congress congressional seat and then five in the House. Uh, our map varied uh, quite a bit from what the Republican map was, uh, but the judge said the map upheld what he said. And so what we'll know is we'll have more representation in the state of Georgia, both from a congressional standpoint, uh, in the Senate standpoint, and a House standpoint. Although I'm disappointed in the way the map came out, uh, I can't argue with the judge's order and that we're, we're going to have a, a new door in Georgia. It's on the horizon. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, can you talk about how this could impact the legislature going into the future? Sure. So as we, Caitlin, we got to where we were because of the judge's order from October that called us back in or required us to go back into special session. And the governor called for that. And we went in in December and gathered up uh, and redrew the maps, both the congressional, the House and the Senate maps and worked very hard to do that. And we were very pleased with the order that came out just a few days ago where Judge Jones said, in fact, that we had fully complied with what his order was back from October. So we will go into the next election cycle for 2024 with those maps setting the districts for House members, Senate members, and congressional members. For going forward, um, I, I don't know that it changes a lot on the political spectrum, um, but as Representative Be Beverly said, uh, for example, on the Senate side, there are two additional majority black districts that were not a part of the maps uh, previously, uh, and the House members added some, and there was one added, uh, one majority black district added to the congressional map that we will all be going to the polls to vote under uh, this coming election cycle for 2024. And we're very pleased. A lot of hard work was done. Our chairman on the Senate side with Shelley Eccles did a lot of work uh, in shepherding our process through on the Senate side to come up with the maps. And we're very pleased that Judge Jones said we have fully complied with his order. Uh, it does affect the Macon delegation and the representation here in central Georgia. How is that going to impact uh, your ability to get some of these issues out that affect central Georgians? Well, I, th well, I think, I mean, quite frankly, we have, uh, given the fact that the House now is going to have a majority in middle Georgia, and so uh, in this delegation we'll have, you know, five, five four seats. Uh, the majority are going to be Democratic seats primarily. And so what will happen is we'll make some decisions on the House side that on the Senate side they'll have to agree to. And so you have sort of a blended opportunity here in middle Georgia to talk really about what is the, what is the process that we take for progress because now we have to consider everybody in the whole community. And so with my dear friend, uh, you know, uh, John Kennedy uh, on the Senate side leading that charge, me on the, on the House side leading this charge, we have a great relationship. But now we have to really struggle with what does middle Georgia look like as we now have to come together and make some real tough decisions about how we move forward. And I'm looking forward to it, quite frankly. Uh, of course, there are things that you're going to agree on and things you're not going to agree Always. on. Always. But something that, that a lot of people can agree on, economy and education are two big topics here in Georgia and things that you know we would all like to see improve. Talk about some plans for the education system. Sure. So on the education front, that's something that we put a lot of emphasis on this past election, this past uh, session in 2023, uh, with particular focus on the issue of literacy in Georgia. What we have found is that while over the last few years we have focused on trying to get graduation rates higher, the literacy rates have not followed that increasing number for graduation rates. And you saw some emphasis, uh, particularly uh, in the Senate and also on the House side of creating a literacy council. I think you're gonna continue to see that. What we know now in focusing on this issue uh, is that th third graders reading on the third grade level are critical for their future, not only as a student, but as a productive adult and being able to enter into the workforce. Um, and so we're gonna continue to work 
on those fronts, as well as making sure that our public education is fully funded. You know, one of the things that we uh, have led the way on with Governor Kemp leading uh, and then the conservatives in the House and the Senate, quite frankly, is since 2022, we have increased teacher pay by over $7,000. Um, and with a $1,000 bonus given just this year in addition to that, that now puts us $7,000 above the average teacher pay in the southeastern states. Not, not saying that's enough and that we don't need to continue to look at that to make sure that teachers are well compensated, but we still have a continuing problem with making sure that all the spots for teacher vacancies are filled because that is a continuing problem. We'll be looking to make sure that we find ways to keep those great teachers in in the school system and we can fill those spots so that our kids are being educated. And can you go in a little deeper into that, uh, Mr. Beverly, about any talks for teacher incentives or educator incentives going into this session? Yeah, I think that, you know, what the Republicans have done has been good, but we also got to think about the kids who are in, in dire need. Uh, right now, if you have kids who are in poverty, and a lot of kids who are struggling right now in poverty, we need to start to think about how do we give them advanced uh, financial incentives to stay in school. So there's something called opportunity weight, which means that as you have, if you're a gifted kid and you're in class, you're going to get a little bit more stuff. Well, kids who don't have a lot need a little bit more stuff too, like maybe an after-school program. How do we actually rightly align a, a quality basic education for those kids who need it most? A kid may come to school without a belt. What do we do with that kid who's hungry in the morning? We gotta talk about those, those kids as well. The other th thing about education that we don't talk about is busing. The buses right now are horrible, they're in horrible shape, and we have to deal with that. And so we have to think about education, not just by the teacher standpoint, but holistically. What happens with the kids? What happens with the ancillary professionals? And then how do we get these kids to school and get it back home safely in buses that we trust? Are there any specific things on the agenda going into this session to address any of those from either one of you? For us, it is. I mean, we're going to talk about opportunity weight. Uh, we dropped a bill last year. We've been doing it for several years. We're going to talk about buses and revamping the buses and certainly the ancillary staff and how do they get play, paid and incentivized uh, as well. So we have bills right now that are, are ready to go. One of the things that we'll be looking at this year uh, that I'm very proud to say that all of us in Middle Georgia and certainly Bibb County can, can take pride in is a program called Leader in Me. Uh, Chairman uh, Robert Dickey on the House side and I worked very hard this past cycle to get funding to, ex to expand the Leader in Me program to uh, 29 different schools across the state in 19 different school districts. And what we've seen for those in Macon that know the Leader in Me program, which takes those principles of success uh, and for children or for adults and puts it in the school setting has been wildly successful here in Bibb County and in the other school systems around the state. And with the additional funding that uh, Chairman Dickey and I were able to secure to take that on a wider scale, we're looking to see those great results elsewhere in the state like we've had here in Bibb County. And if that happens, we'll be looking for more funding to expand that program even more across the state. It's a wonderful program and something that we in Middle Georgia, particularly in Bibb County, can be very proud of. I know something we talked about too that goes hand in hand with education is the economy. Talk about ways to improve the economy and things that you all are going to be talking about going into this session. Yeah, so from, from an economy standpoint, I mean, there, there are five things that I've continued to say and I'll say and say and say, and that is this. In most communities, and especially in, in urban areas where you don't make $70,000 or more, or in rural areas where you don't, just living, living wage or better, you won't find these five things. You will never find them. You'll never find a doctor. You won't find a bank. You won't find transportation to get you to a living wage job. You won't find a grocery store uh, or you won't find a school that you want to send your kid to. And so those five things, when you think about holistically how we approach the communities in which we serve, we got to start thinking about what is the economic drivers that we can put in these communities to now start to think holistically about these five categories. And so we have bills that are talking about that, but our drivers will absolutely be in those in the nature of those five categories. And you'll see a lot coming from Democrats talking about those things. Uh, do you want to add on to that, Mr. Kennedy? Sure. So, you know, fortunately in Georgia, we continue to have a good, robust economy, but that doesn't mean that people, that Georgians aren't struggling. And we're main, mainly struggling because of the, the inflationary pressures that are on everyone when they go to the grocery store, when they spend money elsewhere. And that's something that uh, unfortunately is largely driven out of the policies from the Biden administration coming out of Washington. But in Georgia, thankfully, because of the conservative budgeting approach that our governor and the conservatives in the legislature have taken, our state coffers are in good shape 
and we're going to continue to make sure that we wisely spend taxpayer money because it is that it is taxpayer money not government money and one of the things that we're looking to do and governor kemp had a press conference on this just a few weeks ago is further lowering the income tax state income tax rate we're going to be talking about that more uh, and looking at taking it from the metrics of headed toward uh, which is currently 5.75 percent we should under uh, efforts that we undertook two years ago that'll take it to 5.49 percent and with governor kemp's proposal we'll try to take that to 5.39 percent and assuming the economy stays good in georgia we can keep reducing that to ultimately get to 4.99 percent that's a lower tax rate means more savings for taxpayers to keep money in their pocket instead of sending it to atlanta so part of I, you know, we this is a fundamental difference that we actually have. I think that the ARPA uh, program that Biden has put in place has propped up Georgia, and it's not because of the conservative budgeting that they have. It's because of revenue underestimates by the conservative uh, person who was doing the economy around, you know, what what our revenue should be. We're eleven billion dollar surplus in the state of Georgia, and yet there are four hundred and fifty thousand people in Georgia right now today who don't have health care. 450,000, that's a tragedy. And so we may be the best state in the, in the nation to do business, not if you get sick, not if you're poor. And so when we think about the money that we're gonna reduce taxes even more, you still have half a million people who have, don't have any health insurance. You have kids who 150,000 kids this year have been kicked off of Medicaid, and we're not addressing that. And that's a tragedy. And so why I laud the, the, the Republicans' effort to spin it that they have a great economy. If you're poor, you're sick in the state of Georgia, we can do better than that, and we should. And so we should have a robust conversation around those things. And those are the things I do want to bring up. We do have to take a quick break. We'll talk about those topics and a few others when we come back. Welcome back to Central Georgia Focus. We're taking a look at some of the topics in the upcoming 2024 legislative session for the Georgia General Assembly. Our guests, Representative James Beverly and Senator John Kennedy. We've had some great discussions uh, in our last block. I want to talk about something that comes up year after year, and that is sports betting, and it never seems to pass. Why do you think that is, and what do you think uh, it would take for it to pass? I'll go first. Um, so th that is something that we have actually passed out of the Senate for the past three years um, and sent it to the House. So uh, Leader Beverly is probably in a better position than I am to speak on kind of what's going on with the House with that. Um, but the sports betting issue is something that we've looked at. It is something that is going on uh, because of today's technology uh, is really not going to be changed. So the question is, do we allow the conduct to continue without any regulation or oversight for those that choose to participate and also no tax revenue also for Georgians. And so we have passed it out of the Senate, uh, but it also is something that we advocate that ought to ultimately be on a referendum. So let the people of Georgia decide whether or not sports betting ought to be available. And then uh, I'll let my, my friend here speak to what's going on on the House side with that. You know, on the House side, it's, it's similar, but I think that the deal flows. So when we think about revenue coming into the state, you have new revenue coming in through sports betting. It's a significant amount of money. It's not a small number. That significant amount of money is what do you allocate the money when it comes in? Does it go to the general fund? We already have $11 billion of surplus. Or does it go directly to places where we need it most? And so for us, as again, I'll say the five things, right, a bank, a grocery store, so forth, you got to start thinking about what are the community benefits agreements that happen when sports betting comes in and there's new revenue that comes in? How do we utilize that revenue to incentivize Georgians to do better, to be healthier, to, to live in a way in which they want to? And so I think the, stick, the sticking point in the House has been, and I don't know that it'll continue, but it has been for the last three years, is that where does the revenue go when new revenue comes in, and how do we use that revenue to now lift the, you know, rising uh, tides raise all ships? How do we now raise all the ships in Georgia by a new revenue stream coming in? And I think if we settle that, then I think you'll see favorable uh, outcomes in the House. Uh, since this is something that, that has been continuously talked about, do you think you're a step closer to making that decision and the ability to pass it? I think we are. Um, I think there are, I think we are. Uh, you know, I control 
sort of large block of folk in the house, uh, being the leader of the uh, of the caucus. And I understand my members at a place where it's okay, if we can figure out a way in which to incentivize, you know, business at the base of the pyramid, then we can make sure that we, we move in a, in a direction. And I think what the Senate has done is given us a, the ability to now have a robust conversation in the house. We'll see where it goes with leadership in the house. But I think that this year could be a, a favorable year, but we just got to figure out where does money go when it comes in and make sure that everyone's incentivized the right way in every community in Georgia, not just a few. And do you think the way that it would be set up uh, for the sports betting would be favorable to both sides? Perhaps, it just depends. I mean, I think that there's a, I would say this, I would venture a guess and say that I don't know that the lottery is the best place to put the sports betting. I think there, may, should, there should probably be a sports betting or a gaming type of function that deals with it because the lottery is, is something other than what this is. And so I think there's a, a gaming authority probably has to be established. And, but I do think that a referendum is important as well. I would agree with my, my, my colleague on that, on that behalf. Uh, another topic that I want to make sure we get to, uh, last month DA warning Georgia to shelve its plans to be the first state to allow pharmacies to dispense medical marijuana. What are some plans going into uh, the legislature to address that? So, you know, the, <clears throat> excuse me, Caitlin, the history on this is that we passed Haley's Hope Act mm -hmm. uh, in 2015, and the idea was to try to get this needed uh, new medicinal uh, product, if you will, considered medicinal, uh, to children that needed it. And so we continued to struggle with how do we actually make that happen. And in 2019, we passed uh, Georgia's Hope Act, which was a way that allowed for uh, medicinal marijuana to be produced in Georgia. But during that whole time, the problem or the, the impediment has been at the federal level, it is still classified and scheduled as a drug that has no medicinal value uh, and is one that, of course, is illegal. And so while Georgia has continued to try to do things and our leaders at the state level have continued to try to do things to get this in the hands of, of those patients that need it, um, we keep running into the roadblocks of what's happening at the, at the federal level. Um, and so as you alluded to, the most recent uh, information was that the pharmacy board, in fact, was trying to help facilitate, again, get the product in the hands of those that need it and the patients that need it. But when the federal uh, side came out and said, wait a minute, we're reminding you this is illegal. It unfortunately is a pretty significant hurdle, which brings us kind of back to where we've been all along. This is ultimately going to have to be fixed on the federal level. Otherwise, no matter what we do in Georgia, the, the federal prohibitions that are there now, if they're not changed, is going to continue to create that tension that's going to make it very difficult for patients that need to get to get this as their medicine. Now, what are your thoughts on, yeah. on how this is going? I think Senator Kennedy had it well said. Uh, and I think you've got to change the schedule from Schedule 1. It can't be a Schedule 1 drug. But I think the Biden, the Biden administration, which we should uh, applaud, uh, has just said that he's going to pardon people who have got these drug offenses for medical marijuana, for marijuana in general. I think that's a step in the right direction. And I think that you're starting to see signals from the administration, federal government, to say we got to declassify this from a Schedule 1 to lower so that we can then get the medicine in the hands of people. But I think there's a lot of momentum in that space, and it sounds like we're going to continue to move in that direction. Uh, another topic I wanted to talk about, mental health crisis. Uh, Georgia, Central Georgia, not immune to that. What are some ways that the legislature can address that here? Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so, so that's something that we have worked on of recent and mm -hmm. again to sort of set the stage um, we need to be realistic and admit as we have in reviewing this process that quite frankly our legislature has been behind the curve on doing what we need to do for mental health in the state of Georgia and we saw a significant step forward uh, in 2022 with the passage of, of HB 1013 and it was a significant initiative uh, that did a lot to make sure that patients that need mental health services can in fact avail themselves and that hopefully they'll also be available from the service side. Uh, but that doesn't mean it ends there and quite frankly we do need to do more. There's pending uh, before us now that was dropped in 22, uh, or excuse me, in 23 and that's HB 520, which is another effort to again really get in the weeds and see how our mental health system works, how we're delivering services, more importantly how we're not. You know, a lot of this burden has fallen on law enforcement over the last several years. And talk to your local sheriffs and they'll tell you that unfortunately, we have been making jails 
uh, the, the staying place and staging place for a lot of people with mental health crises and mental health issues, and that's not how this ought to be handled. And so we're going to continue to look at that. We'll be evaluating HB 520. It's in the Senate Health and Human Services Committee right now. We'll continue to work on that. But also sincerely looking for ways to make sure that folks that need these services, in fact, can provide them and trying to be proactive going forward uh, and get us where we need so that those services can, in fact, be provided. And especially, I, I know, talking about rural communities, too, where resources are already stretched thin, how do you put a focus on some of those communities who are really struggling? Yeah, you have to, in, in HB 520, you installed in the Senate, and I'm glad they're going to take it up again this year. And that is, you have to make sure that the payments, you rightly align the pay for the people who are providing. Right now, we're the lowest paid on the prov provisional level, so you're, we're probably $40 million under what we should be paying folk to actually provide services. Not only that, you don't have enough hospital facilities, facilities for mental health awareness. You have women who are, who are in that postpartum or that prepartum phase who are committing suicide because they have mental illness. And so we have to create potentially five new facilities in the state of Georgia, which is gonna cost about 115 million bucks. You add another 40 million that we're already underpaid. And I think that HB 520 begins to address some of those issues. So I'm glad the Senate's gonna take it up, but we need to move on those things now because people are in dire straits and mental illness is what we need to focus on as a whole state of Georgia to make sure that our people stay whole. And I know I, I don't want me to move topics to topic, but I wanna talk about Medicaid expansion. You mentioned it earlier. We're running out of time, but a, a brief talk about, you know, what you each are looking forward to when talking about that topic. Yeah, real quick for me is Medicaid expansion is gonna help rural areas, urban areas alike, because at least we're getting something. Right now, there's a lot of pressure on rural hospitals to give indigent care, and they're getting paid around 12, 15 cents for that indigent care. So people come in, they don't have care, they have to give away care. At least if Medicaid, we expand Medicaid, you move from 12 cents, 15 cents, to 85, 86, 90 cents. At least they're getting money back. And so we really need to move that. And I think we need to stop shutting down hospitals, start taking care of those folks who need to be taken care of, and let's let the economy figure itself out. It's a good economic driver for the state of Georgia. We need to do it now. And very quickly on your end, Mr. Kennedy. Sure, so that's something we have been working on. And in fact, Governor Kemp, uh, initiated uh, his plan for limited Medicaid expansion. And that's what we've been working on. And uh, quite frankly, the Biden administration has actually caused problems in us implementing that here in Georgia. But recently, very recently, we've gotten the green light to move forward. And so we need to see what that program is able to do for those that uh, need to avail themselves of Medicaid benefits. It's a limited Medicaid expansion. It's a smart, common sense way to approach this. Uh, and we'll see what happens there and continue to evaluate. The ultimate two issues really are how do we get better access to Georgians, for Georgians to health care, and also do so in cost-effective ways. And that's what we're trying to do. And we'll continue to look at all options to do that. All right, I know we got a lot to talk about. I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but I want to make sure we get to everything. We got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We've been previewing this year's Georgia legislative session. We've covered a lot of topics. And very quickly, I wanted you to each talk about your top priority going into the session. I'll talk to you. Mine would be create an Office of Urban Affairs in the state of Georgia to address some of the issues that we haven't uh, done so far. And news to Kennedy. Mine is going to be continuing to make sure that education for our children is forefront, that we're being smart about it, um, that we're continuing programs like Leader in Me, and that we're focusing on literacy rates so that children truly can have their version of, of the Georgia dream and the American dream in the future. Right, well, thank you so much, both of you, for being here. Again, we've talked about a lot. I appreciate you all giving your opinions on all of those. Uh, we will be back next week for Central Georgia Focus.